I think we can <laughs> finally start. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much, Simon, for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for coming to listen to me. Um, so you're probably wondering why is it actually important that we know why the Industrial Revolution started. I seem suddenly you find it important given that you've turned up. But actually, I, I, I prefer to call this talk the cultural causes of capitalism. Um, because the Industrial Revolution marks a really, really fundamental change in human history. Something that it, I think is, is completely without precedent. Um, to put it in perspective, since around the long 18th century, so the period from around 1730 to around 1820, um, human wealth, or the amount of wealth that we all have per capita, has increased by around 1,500%. That's not even taking into account technology. So if you were to calculate the number of lumen hours that you get from that light bulb, it's radically higher than if you were to compare it to candles or oil lamps or whatever else came before or just having a fire while you're a caveman sitting, sitting around in your cave. So in terms of the benefit to society, it's a benefit to us, it's not just in wealth but in technology as well, in terms of our living standards, that we've had this huge, huge increase. But what's so special about the Industrial Revolution? And that, I think, is one of the key questions, because there are many, many points throughout human history where we could have had that huge takeoff, that huge acceleration, that hockey stick, as Didier McCloskey calls it, in wealth. Um, during Roman times, they had sufficient technology to be able to do it. They had mechanization to a certain extent. They used water power, and I'll come to that in a second. During Song Dynasty China, just before the Mongols invaded under Chinggis Khan, um, you had a very similar situation where they pretty much almost had an industrial revolution. Um, given that huge increase in wealth, it's kind of a shame that it didn't happen earlier, because where, where would we be now? Maybe a few centuries ahead in terms of technology, in terms of living standards, in, in, in terms of social development. However, the big puzzle here is that you can't just put it down to free markets. You can't just put it down to Smithian growth. So many of you, I assume all of you, will be extremely familiar with the works of Adam Smith. And you'll be extremely familiar with division of labor and with the benefits of free trade. But historians have gone back and they've looked at the period and they've worked out that roughly between 1698 and 1803, when there's a 100% increase in wealth during that one period, only about 13% of that, so 13 percentage points, are down to Smithian division of labor, which is roughly three to seven of that, and the rest is down to free trade. So what accounts for the huge difference? So we've got 13% down to, down to what Adam Smith thought. Why is it 100%? Basically, it's down to technology, down to a T.S. Ashton in 1948 called it a wave of, a wave of gadgets, um, inspired by a student of his who was writing an exam and said, the Industrial Revolution started because there was a wave of gadgets all over Britain. And that's something that really resonates because I think it's one of the best analogies you can come up with as to what happened. Technological development, <laughs> technological development really, really took off really in an unprecedented way. <coughs> and not just in what we think of as the spearheads of industry. It wasn't just in cotton manufacturing. It wasn't just in steam. It wasn't just in coke smelting. But in gardening, in agriculture, uh, in ceramics, in all sorts of other different industries. Pretty much every industry that you can name and think of there was unprecedented levels of innovation. So what are the standard theories about this? And then I'll come on to what my one is. Um, I'll run through these really quickly and probably not do them enough justice, just so I can start talking about the cultural causes. Um, capital increases, that's Marx's standard one. Capital accumulation leads to the bourgeoisie getting more and more wealth and they're able to overthrow feudal landlords and spark this innovative um, change. Unfortunately, capital increase, increases are just not enough. And if they were true, you'd expect in much older institutions like universities, monasteries and the like, which had the most accumulation of capital, to have been the leaders of the Industrial Revolution. But that wasn't the case. It's not the Protestant work ethic, according to date Max Weber. Um, for a start, most of them were not Calvinists. They were Protestants of a sort. They, te they tended to be nonconformists. So his specific theory is a bit wrong, but maybe his general approach to being a cultural change has some merit to it. Um, it's not enclosure. It's another of Marx's arguments that the peasants were thrown off the land so that agriculture could become more efficient. Um, that accounts for about a 1.7% GDP increase relative to the 1,500% that we're trying to explain. Um, it's, not, it's not imperialism either, given that caused hyperinflation for most countries. 
you think of the gold and silver bullion coming into Spain and Portugal. Um, and also you'd expect most other bigger em empires to be more successful. Why the British Empire in particular, rather than the Spanish, the Dutch, the French, and maybe the German. Um, so foreign trade, foreign trade in a sense was probably a bit more important than imperialism could ever have been. Canals, railways, etc., 1.5% roughly. Um, also, they were present, canals in particular, throughout a lot of Rome and throughout a lot of Song Dynasty China. Although, having said that, they were one of the, they were the other kind of, they're called um, efflorescences by Jack Goldstone. So, these efflorescences nearly resulted in the Industrial Revolution, but for some reason, they didn't. Um, and it's not geography. So, Kenneth Diamond, you might be familiar with his guns, germs, and steel. Uh, Jared Diamond, thank you. Um, he explains it as being European dominance. But if it's European dominance, why Britain? Why Scotland and Birmingham in particular? There's, no, there's nothing to account for the specificity of what, ha what happens. It very clearly starts in Britain and it spreads to other countries very quickly, like Belgium, like Holland, Germany, France, um, across, the, across the Atlantic to the United States, and from there onwards. Even now, it's still spreading the, spreading the globe. China, Japan have only really had it in the past century. Um, lots of African countries are only just experiencing that one single change is still kind of going across the globe. Um, and it's not coal, given that's, I think, what most people tend to put it down to. Um, there's a lot of evidence to show that, that Britons could have imported it quite easily, even if there hadn't been any coal reserves, and that would have at least, that would have cost the economy around 1%. Um, so it's not much of a change. And steam wasn't actually that relevant pre about 1830 anyway. The first Newcomen steam engine is, is, is discovered around roughly um, 1712. Thomas Savory's is around the 1690s. Um, 1696, I think, is a patent. Um, but it's not really until the 1830s that they start being used and a lot of industries start actually having a big impact. Um, and it's not the glorious revolution of 1688. Um, this, is a, this is something that's explained by Douglas North a lot, um, saying that it's all to do with institutions. I think institutions are important. I disagree with North in the fact that he thinks that formal institutions are rather important, and I think they're not. 1688, bless you. 1688 was very important for raising a national debt to fund wars, but was not particularly important when it came to funding the Industrial Revolution. Even though it resulted in the Bank of England and the Stock Exchange in London, um, <laughs> Shouldn't have expected that. Um, uh, it, most of that money did not then feed into what was happening in terms of industry and manufacturing. A lot of that went towards foreign investors, towards banking and various other industries that then didn't have an impact. Most of the industrial revolution is very locally financed, <coughs> financed by people within your own fa within the family, as if you're an inventor, or by people who share the same religious beliefs or political beliefs. So they can, they tend to gather in clubs. So it's not that. Um, so what is it? I, I tend to call it an ideology of innovation because I think there are a lot of aspects to a, a subculture that takes hold during the long 18th century. And I'm talking here from roughly the 1700, maybe even a bit before, and it gradually gains, gains pace. So that by around 1780 to 1830, we've got a full-blown first industrial revolution. And the, the elements of this thing are... So I've identified Newtonian systematic experimentation, a bit of a mouthful. Um, but what that means to say is that it's not science, or not quite science. To give you an example, sundial, in order to have a working sundial and be able to tell the time, you don't need to understand that the sun goes around the earth. You don't need to have an understanding of some of the physics that goes into these things in order to get them to work. A lot of the key inventions and, and a lot of the progress that occurs are not huge macro inventions like the discovery of how steam power can radically transform things. They're small incremental tinkering and changes. Newtonian systematic experimentation is the process by which people start to note down the changes in the experiments that they make so they don't repeat the mistakes that they've made in the past. And then it's about, to take this, this a step further, it's about the diffusion of that knowledge. So encyclopedias journals, almanacs, for measuring, counting, classifying, and cataloging. This is not to do with understanding, and maybe those, those things are a part of science, but a lot of science has to do with uh, analysing what those things are that they're counting and cataloging. People suddenly had, massive they had suddenly had a massive availability of data. 
and that data they were able to then transform into useful innovations. Even the patent system, I'm, ass I'm assuming half, the, half of you are going to say boo and half of you are going to say hooray, um, even the patent system becomes more specific from around 1734 to 1778 due to a particular judge who starts ruling that you have to be specific and start giving in drawings of your inventions. Otherwise, what you get is the sort of thing that happened um, around, let's say, let's say let's, actually, let's take Thomas Savory's 1696 um, patent of, of steam. Um, his patent was so ill-defined that Newcomen's later engine, which was far superior in 1712, and actually had moving parts um, that could actually start pumping things, whereas the Savory engine was extremely basic and was basically just describing the pumping action. Um, it was so non-specific that, that, the other, that Newcomen was unable to patent his inventions. And so you gradually get this more and more specificity when it comes to describing inventions, and even when it comes to the legal system or the patent system, which makes it much easier to combine existing practices as well. Encyclopedias, for the first time, make it easy, if you're, if you're researching one subject, to make the leap that you might need to create a macro invention. The combining of industries, even when you yourself haven't been practicing that industry as an apprenticeship, or as a master or journeyman, or as a general manufacturer. How else can you expect a weaver to come up with something in chemistry, which does happen? Um, so think of Court's puddling or Crompton's cotton mule as being key examples that are influenced by encyclopedias. Even further than that, though, it takes a social aspect, this diffusion of knowledge. Uh, Masonic lodges, um, set up by Desagulier, um, Benjamin Franklin, the famous Birmingham Lunar Society really take off. Um, that's Erasmus Darwin, Charles Darwin's grandfather, um, a doctor sets up the Birmingham Lunar Society, called the Lunar Society because they met by the light of the full moon, because it was when they could actually walk home um, and be able to see what's going on before gas, gas, gas lights, um, street lamps came about. Um, the sort of people who would take part in the Birmingham Lunar Society would be Watt, Bolton, Josiah Wedgwood, many of the greats um, that, we, that we tend to associate with the Industrial Revolution. However, this also reduces the social and cultural cost to innovation. By then banding together, they exchange ideas more rapidly. They also share their ideas when it comes to their experimentation and technical progress. However, one of the things I'm studying as part of my PhD is to see what the impact of that thing in particular is on invention. Now, I found it probably does have a cumulative effect, but it's not what usually gets people sparked. It's not what usually inspires them towards invention in the first place. What usually happens is they catch the invention bug they start experimenting, they start patenting, they start giving out their, their knowledge um, and sharing their expertise. But it's only then that they become famous enough to be invited to these societies or to then become associated with them. In, some, in certain cases, they join the societies beforehand, but often it's actually a form of social recognition. But that in itself, I think, is important. If people start looking at these societies and saying, well, I want to be part of that as well, it's a cultural goal that people then try to aspire to. Then, then I think it goes even further than that. Certain people really are ideologues when it comes to this. They take an open source, I guess that's the modern term, approach to experimentation. So an example of this is Lean's engine reporter in 1811 set up for Cornish tin and copper miners. Now, there's a good story behind this because Watt and Bolton are probably some of the, some of the worst patent trolls um, known to human history because they retarded... Um, steam inventions by at least around 15 to 20 years because of their patents. Because not only did they, did they take a, a patent for the separate condenser, but they were ruthless in enforcing it, and ruthless in preventing other people improving on it, even though those inventions could have been patented as something above and beyond. Um, what they also then did is they petitioned Parliament to extend the patent to around 1800. So in 1800, the moment their patent finally expired, what happens? Well, what used to happen is Cornish tin, my, tin and copper miners in particular um, would employ consultants to, and then they would license these engines out from Watt and Bolton. The moment 1800 hit, they withdrew all of their engineers. So suddenly Cornish tin, tin and copper miners were unable really to, to operate their, their machinery effectively or improve it or repair it when things broke down. So in 1811, they all banded together and they started sharing their experiments with one another, openly, for free. That's what Lean's Engine Reporter is, and I think it's extremely important, because it, as an as illustrative example of the sort of thing that was going on. 
Other examples of patent abstinence, for example, Rennie, Smeet and Trevillick, and Dar Abraham Darby II, I'll read out his quote, he said he would not deprive the public from such an acquisition as coke smelting. Now, he did patent other things, but with his main invention, what he considered to be his principal invention, he refrained from painting it because, patenting it because he thought that it would be of great benefit to society. So there is this ideological commitment to society that outweighs personal profitable gain. Now, another institution that I've come across in, in the courses of my research into this is the society, what we now know as the Royal Society of Arts, what was then known as the Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufacturers, Industry and Commerce. Now, the interesting thing about them is that you could only win a prize from them, which often involved some kind of remuneration or a gold medal or silver medal or something of the like, not just for the arts, but if you were to not patent an invention and then provide them with a full and detailed account that could then be verified and could then be improved upon. So a lot of inventors, as part of the list that I'm compiling of them, are either taking part in this as a kind of counter to the patenting system. It's, a, it's an alternative institution that encourages inventors not to patent their inventions, but to actually allow others to improve upon them. Now, the interesting thing about that is that the societal and cultural makeup of these people, they do tend to be wealthier. They do tend to be a bit more mainstream, a lot more establishment. After all, the Society of Arts does become the Royal Society of Arts because it becomes a very establishment organisation. However, there are still examples of extremely, well, just out of nowhere, unheard of people, often very poor, coming up with great inventions and submitting them and getting prizes. Now, another thing I'm investigating is, the, is, not, is their politics and, and their philanthropic activities. So for those of them who became rich, what did they then spend their money on? As evidence of there being some kind of subculture that promotes innovation. Um, a lot of people, particularly when they're nonconformists and when they're Whigs, rather than Tories, or particularly radical Whigs, um, they tend to reinvest into religious, in, into their nonconformist religious schools in particular. Um, so Quakers, I'm talking um, Presbyterians, Unitarians, rather than Anglicans, um, and even a few Calvinists and Roman Catholics. Um, and so they're reinvesting back into education, into religion, often into funding other inventions or giving loans to other people who are also inventors but are of like-minded religious and political persuasions. Now McCloskey, Deirdre McCloskey, and I encourage you to read her book, um, Bourgeois Dignity, mm -hmm. um, she says another thing, one of the most core fundamental things is tolerance for commerce. Um, I think there's something to this. Britain does attract a lot of foreign inventors, a lot of immigrants. There's Argand Aimé, who's a gaslighting pioneer. The Brunel family, um, Mark and Isambard Kingdom Brunel. Um, Mark actually having been an immigrant directly to, to Britain, and Isambard Kingdom having been a second generation immigrant. Um, Schwepp, who we might, Johann Schwepp, who we might mm -hmm. know as being the inventor of Schwepps. Mm -hmm. um, so soda water. Um, Friedrich Windsor Koenig, who invents the, the, the steam-powered press for the Times in 1814. And there are other things that we have to thank um, immigrants for, like chlorine bleaching, the Jacquard silk loom, flax wet spinning, and particularly food canning. But it's, I don't think it's just tolerance for commerce. I think Britain does get a reputation for being somewhere that is <coughs> welcoming to immigrants, particularly when they're, when they're having labour-saving inventions of these kinds. Um, but another thing that's special about Britain, I think, is that there is no famine for the pretty much the entire period. And the reason for that, I think, is because it's the first time where Britain actually has a national market. So if you were to compare to France, you'd have a toll booth pretty much at every entry to a city, at every river crossing, at every, every road crossing. Now, because of the English Civil War, a lot of that broke down and just couldn't happen anymore. And so what happens is Britain gets a fully national market. And what that means is that when, the, the, when there is a famine, price gouging is allowed to occur. People are allowed to very easily move their grain to areas that are in grave need. Um, there are a lot of near famines, but the interesting thing about them is that they do always come up with some kind of solution. People always do come in and save them from it, even if it's very costly to begin with. Now, there's a few other things. There's values of trust, honesty, responsibility. Now, maybe these are the sorts of things that you'd associate with commerce. 
Um, but I still think they're insufficient. Commerce had been happening, I mean, Britain had always been a fairly commercial society. And there are plenty of other examples of commercial societies that didn't have the Industrial Revolution, that didn't have this massive explosion of wealth. Take um, the Italian republics of the Renaissance, for example, all very highly commercial societies where, frankly, all the merchants were in charge. So what is it that's special about Britain? I think partly it's some of these ideological commitments that I'm testing, um, but also I think there's a tolerance for innovation. Now, again, there's a bit of a story here. It starts off legally... It's basically, legally, it was basically illegal, according to a lot of Tudor laws, to have labour-saving inventions from a, in around 1700, 1730s. Which meant that instead of having machine-breaking, like Luddism, that you'd associate with around 1812 to 1817, um, what happens is that workers will take inventors to court and sue them, and often quite successfully sue them. Workers don't like being, un being made unemployed by technological progress, and so they have the legal system on their side. However, what we see over the course of the, of the long 18th century is that they start losing these court cases, more and more of them, and then they start lashing out. They start resorting to violence, essentially, in many places. They start machine-breaking. Luddism, if anything, is a culmination of that. I mean, I'm just going to list off a few dates as to when machine-breaking occurred, because we always associate associated with Luddism, but it has a much longer history. 1675, 1719, 1736, throughout the 1760s mechanical sawmills are attacked. Um, James Hargreaves' spinning jennies have to be, were destroyed in 1767 and 1769. The wool industry in, in the West Country is completely ravaged in 1776, 1779 as well. And then it keeps going. I mean, I, I won't, I'll, I'll stop the list there because it is pretty much endless. And even that even what I've listed here in, in total is probably not even close to how many there were, because I think many of them probably just weren't recorded, um, because a lot of inventors were either forced to emigrate from that particular county and forced to go to different cities, um, or just didn't take legal means because the legal system in their area at the time was still not on their side. But the key thing is, is that the establishment is increasingly persuaded over, the legal establishment in particular, but also the political establishment. At the beginning of the period, is, you have mercantilism. Very, very strong mercantilism. Um, it's not just illegal, but a lot of politicians still favour order and not having unemployment over having technological progress. But it's by the end of the period that you start getting free trade. All the famous victories of free trade are really from the 1820s and around 1844. I mean, if, if we think about... Uh, when, when the Corn Laws were finally abolished. But it's actually, I think, a very gradual progress, uh, process. One of the things I'm trying to study is the number of bills that are presented to Parliament rather than the acts that are passed and then, and then um, that are pro-innovation, that are pro-technology, that are pro-capitalism and pro-free trade, rather than, and, and then looking at who was funding those MPs, whether it was people who are a member of that subculture and how they were being persuaded of those ideas. Because I think it's a very gradual transition over the course of the period. As, as technology um, continues to grow, because of this, this dissident subculture, the benefits of that technology become increasingly apparent um, to the legal and political establishments. And I think there is a role for rhetoric here as well, for, for their powers of persuasion. But I think there are also some, there, and also there are some values here. Curiosity, for example, tolerance, in a sense, is insufficient when it comes to wanting innovation. People are always trying to go for some kind of novelty. And it's not just politically, religiously, legally um, that these people are in a subculture, they're in a dissident minority, but also in terms of their culture. Um, de Vries talks about a new culture that displaces the old luxury, a new luxury, if you like. Um, so the old luxury, in a nutshell, would be the sort of thing that you'd associate with Downton Abbey. The agricultural estates, the people who are very um, tied to the land, they're tied to improving the land, they're very patriarchal. Um, a, lot, a lot of their titles are inherited. Um, they're very anti-money, they're very anti-commerce in many ways. They're quite, they think it's vulgar, they think it's disdainful. But this is the first time that you start getting hierarchy replaced with class to a certain extent. You start getting people distinguishing themselves by their wealth rather than their titles. You start getting people 
distinguishing themselves by a consumer culture. They start buying Josiah Wedgwood's amazing pottery. They start buying new glass. Um, partly, this, may, this might be due to foreign trade, um, especially as it becomes internationally, internationally um, viable. So, for example, spices coming in, they promote that consumer culture. Tea, coffee in particular. Um, cotton, cocoa, porcelain, and tobacco as well. Another great examples of things that spark this new luxury culture. Um, and again, this is something that initially is illegal. You used to have laws that prohibited you from dressing in a particular way or using certain dyes at the beginning of the period. By the end of the period, the establishment figures are now trying to ape the people who are originally in that distant minority. They're, they start investing into that culture. They start um, promoting public concerts, which is another manifestation of a new, pub new consuming public. Um, they start giving to museums so, and then opening their homes as museums to the public. They start engaging in the new culture. And lastly, I should really just come to religion. So the dissenters I mentioned, Unitarians, Quakers, Freethinkers. Now there's something very important about that. Because, because of the Test Act, um, sorry, no, before that. They're tolerated after 1689 with the Glorious Revolution. However, for pretty much the entire period, until 1813, um, for Unitarians, and until 1828 for all these other dissident religious minorities. They are excluded from the political process, from, the from high up posts in the military, um, from mainstream academia like Oxford and Cambridge, which might explain why so many inventors went to Edinburgh and Glasgow. Um, they're excluded. They can't even really take the oaths to join guilds. So I found a lot of um, Quaker clockmakers in London who were constantly fined by the Clockmakers mm -hmm. Guild because they refused to swear the oaths. And some of them not turning up, because some of the duties that you'd have as a guild would, would be to, in charge, to be in charge of various administrative things associated with the Anglican Church. So some of them would just say, well, I don't really want to turn up and run this Anglican Church given I'm a Quaker. And so they'd pay fines for that as well. So what's interesting, I think, there is that they were, because they're shut out of the mainstream political process, I mean, what, what else have they got to do? Commerce and industry, commerce and manufacturing. Now, this is a bit disturbing from a libertarian perspective because it suggests that politics doesn't really matter all that much. It's more really to do with what, with what we as individuals do in terms of technology. Now, I think there's a good message there and there's a frightening message. The frightening message is that it doesn't matter so much what kind of policies the government has in place to try to crush innovation. Um, a great thing, though, about modern capitalism, of course, is that it's now an international movement. It used to be confined to Britain and could have been crushed in the early stages very quickly. But then as it started to spread to other countries, I think you start getting hubs of innovation that lead the rest of the world. Africa doesn't need to have the same stages of growth. It doesn't need to go through what Britain did in the Industrial Revolution. All it needs to do is jump ahead. It can simply take or import the technology that is already available and skip steps, if you like. They can suddenly have massive increases in wealth. That's why they can grow at 10 to 15% GDP per year, rather than what Britain had to endure for centuries of about 2 to 3%. Right, well, I'm going to open it to questions. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.